Sam, Mickey, so nice to see you and welcome to this conversation about Living Earth Community. You've had a wonderful uh, background and career studying with Baird Calicott as an undergraduate, one of the leading environmental ethicists, and George James, uh, one of our friends from Columbia. Um, and then you came to the California Institute of Integral Studies in San Francisco, where Brian Swim and Sean Kelly and Rick Tarnas and many others were teaching in very creative ways. And that's where we met about 13 years ago when we were teaching a class and you came into that class and shined. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you've been a great um, help, supporter, partner in the Forum on Religion and Ecology all those years from the very beginning with the website to right now and to being the uh, book editor for Worldviews and teaching at the University of San Francisco and doing at least half a dozen books uh, already. So it's a remarkable contribution that you've made. And uh, we look forward to seeing all the contributions coming forward. So if you'd like to add to that, please do. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, well, it's a pleasure to be, uh, to be involved, to be included in all this. And, and even hearing a little bit of my background from you there, I'm reminded of how uh, much of a privilege it's really been. I've had such great teachers and so many uh, great environmental leaders have been a part of my education. So it's been a kind of natural step for me to keep getting more and more involved with this work. And uh, it's really a blessing to, to do so. And then uh, getting involved with the uh, Living Earth Community Project has been particularly special because it's just all of my favorite authors and thinkers kind of involved in this one project together. So it's just been a treat uh, to get to know people and to get to know their work a little better. Yeah, well, we're thrilled that you're going to be editing this book, an online book, um, and making it available beyond um, a, a limited group. And that's why we're also doing these interviews. So uh, we'd like to just draw you in of um, Living Earth Community. What, what does that mean in terms of your own thinking and teaching, writing? What does it occur to you? Yeah, it's a provocative title uh, by itself. And when people think of the earth, I think they often think of like a rock hanging in space somewhere that happens to have some life on it. And then when you think about living earth community, you start to think, well, maybe the earth is not just something that life is on, but something that life is an active participant in. And so life is a par partner in the earth's evolution. And so humans and all of the other animals and plants and bacteria and fungi that we share this planet with, we're actually uh, integral members of, uh, of this planet's evolution. And you can just see that with the development of our atmosphere, right? When Earth first evolved, no oxygen. How did oxygen get there? It was photosynthesizing organisms. So from the very beginning of a life's presence on Earth, it started to change Earth. Earth changes life. Life changes Earth. And so the community that humans are participating in is in part of this larger Earth community. So a lot of what the project is about is getting humans uh, to have a little bit broader sense of who we are, that our local human communities are connected to a larger global human community, but that global human community is also situated in this larger Earth community. Yeah, beautiful. And people are beginning to talk about planetarialities and so on and Earth kinship and, and new terms are arising. And how, how do you see this emerging in the literature that we are part of, of a living planet uh, of these systems? Right. That's particularly exciting. You see every field of study starting to open up to this kind of new vision. And uh, for instance, in anthropology, which is, of course is a study of humans, you would think that could be something where people are just going to talk about humans, but increasingly anthropologists are talking about multi-species kinship relationships, that the human species is a multi-species event, that we couldn't be who we are without all of our kin, and uh, including non-human kin. And then in philosophy, increasingly you hear people talk about environmental ethics, environmental philosophy, uh, even old materialist philosophy, which is generally pretty... Um, negative toward things like soul or spirit. Uh, even materialist philosophy has opened up into what people call a new materialism, which is really saying it turns out matter is much more lively and intelligent than we ever really knew it was. And finding out that uh, the emotional capacities of humans aren't really unique to humans, they're found in other kinds of animals. 
communication isn't just found in animals, it's also found in plants. And so we're learning more about plant intelligence. So these kinds of things, uh, a kind of new turn in anthropology toward the non-human and a turn in philosophy toward understanding the uh, vitality and the vibrant power of matter. Uh, it's been exciting to see. It gives me a lot of hope to see uh, all these academic fields kind of waking up to our participation in this earth community. Yeah, I love that. And and you have read widely in these areas. Um, so what, what does, just to pause for a moment, you know, what does new materialism mean, just to elaborate it a little bit more in relation to living earth community? What's the consequence of that, these ideas, new, new materialism, for example? Right. Yeah, that's a good question. It's uh, still kind of being worked out. It's hence the new. People yeah. are tr still trying to figure out what would this mean for our ethics and our politics. But the big discovery is that what modern science had thought of as the passive and inert kind of qualities of matter turn out to be totally inaccurate. That all of these qualities that we associate with uh, animals or with humans seem to go all the way down into the most elementary particles of the material world. So something like agency or decision-making seems to be happening throughout the whole material world. So the materialists are saying, well, I guess materialism must be different now because we've discovered that matter is a lot more interesting than any of us ever knew. And if matter has more agency than we thought, then it might deserve more ethical concern. It might need more political representation. And so this would go way beyond animal rights. At this point, we're going to have to start talking about plant rights, ecosystem rights. And of course, we see this around the world with giving uh, the rights of uh, legal personhood to rivers or to mountains. Yeah. So those are the kind of political efforts that new materialism would actually help uh, provide some philosophical foundations for. Right. And this, so picking that up, the rights of nature is what you're referring to, of course. And uh, in Cochabamba in Bolivia several years ago, maybe just, I don't know, five years ago, the Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Nature was written um, coming out of this notion that Thomas Berry spoke of too, the need for a new earth jurisprudence because the communion of subjects, this, the livingness of, of these systems needs to be recognized. So I think you're exactly right. There's a philosophical side, there's a spiritual religious side, an ethical side emerging, but the, the, it's being played out rather robustly um, in politics and law. Uh, and if you want to add anything to that, uh, please do. Yeah, I mean, that's the exciting thing, I think, for the part, philosophers don't always get to feel that they're making positive contributions to legal or political changes. And to see uh, you know, materialist philosophy find a home in that is really a sign that things are changing. Even yeah. materialists who are not normally that involved are yeah. starting to recognize how urgent these issues are and how important it is to start facilitating transformation really quickly. Yeah, yeah. We just had a conference at Yale here with a whole panel on rights of nature, which was amazing. And that Universal Declaration of the Rights of Mother Earth got all the way to the floor of the UN, actually, um, uh, a few years back. And that's it's pressing itself forward, as you said, the rights of rivers like in New Zealand, two rivers in India, the Yamuna and the Ganges. And just recently, even Lake Erie by the city of Toledo was considered, um, it, given the, the personhood, to be represented. So um, this is uh, astonishing, actually, how quickly this is moving into human consciousness. And as you say, because the issues are getting more and more urgent, I think. And yeah. how, how are your students responding to this? Are they moving nimbly and fluidly into this notion of the, living, the livingness of Earth? Yeah, sometimes it's actually surprising to me that um, how little they resist that, that they kind of grew up in a world where it was pretty obvious to them. And uh, whereas, you know, I'm not that much older than them, but even in that one generation difference, uh, there's this really big gap where for me, it was still a, a bit of a journey to learn about things like plant communication and the emotional lives of animals and things like this. But for them, that's just been the norm in the scientific community since they were born. And so then when I tell them that plants communicate, they are just kind of bored by that fact. Like, oh, okay, sure. Like, yeah. don't, don't you see how revolutionary that is that 
we for you know thousands of years in, in like Western philosophy, and we thought plants don't have intelligence. And uh, my students are just like, well, that's that seems dumb. Yeah, yeah. It's the easiest thing for them to accept. And I just think, you know, some of these kids are born at a time when all of the scientific literature on animals was saying animals have agency, intelligence, emotional lives, a sense of ethics and justice. And so that's just the world they grew up in. So that yeah. gives me a lot of hope. It's so I know it doesn't take any convincing uh, to have them understand that the world isn't just a collection of objects, but it is, as Thomas Berry said, a communion of subjects that every single being that we share this earth with has some kind of agency or subjectivity. And then yeah. the students are just uh, ready to take that on and then want to go apply that in their own communities. Yeah. Yeah. I think this, I like to speak of an intergenerational handshake, as you know, and this is what strikes us and our students too, um, is they're, they're there, they're ready to move into the space. And these books, The Hidden Life of Trees, Thinking Like a Forest of Eduardo Cohn and, and so on. It's like, yes, we can see it scientifically. We can speak about it poetically and we can see what the ethical implications are. That's very exciting. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. One of the things that helps keep me going in this work is just seeing how my students have this kind of innate uh, understanding and enthusiasm for this. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this may seem obvious because we keep talking over our 13 year conversation of this communion of subjects and you've referred to agency and subjectivity. But can you unpack it a little bit? Because I've noticed for others, this isn't so obvious. So what are we saying when we're using the word subjectivity? Right. Yeah. Because it's not like saying uh, self-awareness necessarily. Yeah. Uh, there's all these different capacities that things have for acting and for connecting to other beings around them. And so even when one atom bonds with another atom, like an ionic bond or a covalent bond, like what's happening there? It's not just that things are getting pushed around by other things, you know, just like atoms bumping into other atoms. They're uh, doing something. And so that's where we'll talk about agency, just in the sense of a capacity to act. Mm -hmm. So the capacity to act, or like to bond. Like when humans bond, it sounds very loving and emotional. There's something like that happening, but on a very rudimentary level with even atoms. And that there's some signal that one atom will be able to give another atom based upon its electrons that lets them know if they can bond. And so likewise, plants are signaling to other plants when it's time, for instance, uh, to fruit, like pecan trees with massed fruiting, how they all fruit at the same time. They all drop those pecans. So the world is giving signs there's meaning or significance. And then we just see it played out differently with different kinds of things. So atoms have one way of doing that. And then plants have another way. Bacteria has its own way of navigating its way through the world. Uh, and then, of course, with humans, we have something like self-awareness. And that's a very uh, refined form of subjectivity that's capable of expressing itself with symbols and so for the most part, a lot of people have a tendency to think that's what subjects normally look like. It's the human subject. And then what we're trying to say is actually that's a, a late addition to the whole subjectivity game. It's actually been playing for the whole history of the universe. And we see these more rudimentary forms, which don't necessarily have consciousness or self-awareness, but there is agency, a capacity to act. And then in the animal realm, you start to see sentience and different capacities for sensing the world. And then with humans, we see this fully developed self-reflexive awareness or self-consciousness. Yeah, beautiful. So there's a continuity, isn't there, of, right. uh, of this sentience all the way up to self-reflexive symbolic consciousness and so on. Ursula Goodenough, in the Journey Conversations, Journey of the Universe Conversations, she's a cell biologist. And she says, as you know, that even in the cell, there's some sense of self, of motility and uh, re reproduction, but also of what comes in through the membrane and that she calls it discernment um, of deciding what can enter and what cannot. So all the way back to the cell, there's some sense of this subjectivity that we're talking about. Very exciting, really. Yeah, and to find out that uh, we're not so alone in the world, that, uh, that there's something like us all around us. And this idea that humans are kind of the only and lonely source of meaning in the world is just gone now. 
And it yeah. turns out that even the, an individual cell is making meaning, deciding what comes in, what goes out, what's the self, what's the other, and everything's negotiating and navigating its world like that. So it's it's much more exciting to be living in a in a world that's just saturated with meaning and significance. Yeah, yeah, that's a, such a great point. And uh, Eduardo Cohn in his book Thinking Like a Forest speaks of this biosemiotics, right? The signaling that you've been talking about. Right. And so on. now you've just said. Um, something extremely interesting, a, a world saturated with meaning. And we've been living in, by and large, in a modern world without meaning and purpose, right? Because evolution is stripped of any sense of purpose, of telos, and, and so on. And everything's been kind of reduced to random processes, mechanistic um, processes that uh, that don't add up to anything meaningful. But so let me just have you unpack. Of course, it's a laden word. It's it's not simple. But what does that mean? A world saturated with meaning. Right. That you know, when I decide to uh, stand up, that it's my intention to stand up that gets me up. That I have something to do. It's not just uh, muscles and bones and sinews and a nervous system and a cardiovascular system. All those parts that interact with each other are doing stuff, but intention. I have something I want to do. There's some significance to me standing up. Maybe if I'm, maybe I'm standing up because I have to go somewhere or whatever. But in every kind of action like that for an animal or as biosemiotics is saying, really for all life, there's the significance. There's the semiotics, the sign. And so it's really meanings and significance that are driving us around. And there's the old kind of uh, mechanical idea of what causes things is that it's just atoms bumping into other atoms. But the more that we look into how animals live their lives, how plants live their lives, how humans live their lives, it's not really just the things bumping into other things that drive us. It's the meaning. And so if you really analyze something uh, like the very simple activity of a cell, you see that it's what's meaningful to the cell is what's going to come into the cell. And so right, the, just the basic process of metabolism where you're uh, taking the outside world and putting it in you and exchanging energy, that's all done because you're protecting yourself. There's the self-organization. And you repair yourself when yourself gets sick or uh, wounded, uh, the reproduction of the self right through uh, sexual reproduction. So it's the meaning. Selves are trying to exist, they're trying to connect, and it's not just random activities of atoms bumping into other atoms. There's really uh, beings that try, that intend, and those intentions are then woven out uh, throughout our whole Earth community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I love the way you've put that. Um, we could also maybe say, um, on a macro scale, clearly, Evolution works by chance, randomness, and necessity. The, this word will, things have their collective emergence and emergent properties and so on. And you've mentioned this wonderful word, self-organization. In other words, we can, we can still accept that chance and necessity or randomness and meaning are mingled, right? That, they're, that um, things are not clearly moving either in one direction and so on. But this term self-organization is helpful here and maybe also emergence. Can you say something about what those terms mean? Yeah, emergence is a great way to understand precisely that kind of balance between uh, chance and necessity. Because on the one hand, we all are obeying the laws of nature, the laws of physics are working on us, and yet new things happen. Uh, life emerging out of matter, more complex forms of life emerging out of simple forms of life. So emergence is generally a way of talking about the way uh, that new levels or scales of existence have developed throughout the history of evolution. And it never happens just uh, through total randomness. Uh, but at the same time, it's not totally determined and programmed either. It's creative. Yeah. And something about creativity is when you work with all the conditions that you're given, and so in that sense you're very determined by those, they kind of force you into a constrained position, and yet somehow something new develops. And those dynamics that are driving emergence based upon uh, you know, current research in biology especially, uh, people refer to as self-organization. So these organizing dynamics, and you can see it in a whirlpool, 
where water organizes itself into this kind of funneling pattern. And if that stabilizes enough, and uh, proteins and amino acids and things like that can help that happen, then all of a sudden you can have something like a living cell. So the same dynamics, but something totally new has emerged. A whirlpool is kind of self-organizing, but it doesn't repair itself. Whereas a tree or a bacterium or a human body, if I'm cut, for instance, I repair myself. So we see new capacities of self-organization emerging at these different levels of evolution from matter to life. Uh, to human consciousness. Yeah. So self-organization is a way to understand that kind of balance where uh, meanings and intentions are creating new levels of existence. And at the same time, it's doing that in a way that's engaging with the basic causal mechanisms of our life, engaging with the material conditions and constraints of, uh, of existence. That's beautiful. So well put, so well stated. And maybe we can take this um, as we're moving towards concluding, but towards... Okay, creativity is such a rich word that you've introduced here. And some of our thinking collectively about this living earth community is how can we align our human creativity with the creativity of earth systems? I mean, we're doing it, of course. We've done it for hundreds of thousands of years in certain ways just by agriculture and farming and so on. And now we're trying to do it by solar and wind power and a geothermal power. We're aligning with these great powers of the natural world. So maybe just comment um, for a moment on this striving to align our creativity with Earth's creativity. Mm, right. Yeah, that's the struggle, right? This, uh, you know, humans out of alignment with the earth community is causing problems, not only for humans, but also for the rest of life on earth. And so that alignment is crucial for the survival of humankind and for the survival of all the species and ecosystems we inhabit the planet with. One of the things I like to tell people is that it's not as daunting as it sounds. Because if you look at the last couple hundred years of industrialization and all this uh, really destructive human development, it might seem almost impossible for humans to get in a proper alignment with the earth so that we'll have a more uh, mutually enhancing relationship instead of a destructive relationship. So how are we going to do it? I often tell people, don't worry. It turns out you're already doing it. You're already much more aligned with uh, the earth's processes than you think. For instance, we all have bacteria living in our gut. So we already have kind of solidarity with non-humans just by virtue of our normal digestive processes, that you're already doing it. And so just let that into your life a little more, like let that into your awareness, and you'll realize how much you actually already have a pretty friendly relationship <laughs> with millions of organisms that are living inside of you or on you. There's a whole species of bacteria that just live in the crook of the human elbow. And so we already have those friends all around us, even people who just love their dog or cat. And just by petting your cat and you have this friendship, you have this sense of solidarity with a non-human being, uh, it's that kind of alignment we're looking for. And so we really just need to bring that stuff to the fore more. We don't need to uh, invent anything out of whole cloth here. We actually just need to relax into our natural mode of community, that we're already part of a living Earth community. We're actually already integral to that Earth community. So we don't need to do anything totally new uh, as if we have to completely figure out how to live totally different lives. All we have to do is really be the earthlings that we are. And the more we can see how much we're already participating in that living earth community, the more that we'll see we have this inexhaustible resource of partners to do this work with. Yeah. And so there's no shortage of community and partnership and energy uh, for us to figure out new ways to live together here on earth. Yeah. Beautiful. So well stated. And um, it evokes gratitude, doesn't it, uh, from us when we realize, just as you said, we're part of something larger. Uh, Sam, thank you so much. You say it so clearly. Your reading over so many years, your writing, your publishing uh, has been such a contribution to this work. And we're thrilled that you're editing this volume on the Living Earth Community. So thank you, Sam. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of it.